So hello, everybody out there. Uh, welcome to the Earth Hour Unplugged pre-party panel chat. Um, in the spirit of reconciliation, we acknowledge that we live, work, and play on the tra traditional territories of the Blackfoot Confederacy, Tutsina, the Yaxi Nakoda Nations, the Métis Nations of Region 3, and all people who make their homes in the Treaty 7 region of Southern Alberta. I'll follow up the land acknowledgement and I'll to say that any global shift that does not include a just transition for the world's BIPOC, youth, economically disadvantaged, as well as communities from transitioning industries sets itself up for failure. This effort requires buy-in from everybody, which means historically underrepresented voices need a seat at the table now more than ever. Quick programming notice, your Calgary Climate Hub has two pretty cool events coming up over the next month, including Wednesday, March 30th at 5 p.m. for our next episode of A Climate of Change, featuring our partner organization, Climate Reality Canada, uh, and uh, the wonderful Margot Berger-Poyer to talk about the latest National Climate League standings. The National Climate League involves Canadians from jurisdictions across the country seeking data from their political leaders on where we are in the transition to a climate-friendly future and a shared effort to make sure that we measure what matters. That's going to be a great show. I hope you'll join us. The RSVP will be in the chat shortly. The other event I want to put on your radar before we get started is April 6th at 7 p.m. for the Edmonton uh, slash Calgary Mayor's Summit on Climate Change. That's a joint effort by the Edmonton Climate Hub and the Calgary Climate Hub. This is your opportunity to hear the mayors of Alberta's largest cities, Mayor Amarjeet Sohi of Edmonton and Mayor Jyoti Gondek of Calgary, discuss their strategies for climate action. Join us for this event, moderated by Laura, Laura Lynch, host of CBC's What on Earth, which promises to be a compelling session. Two highly engaging mayors, both of whose city councils declared a climate emergency. The RSP, RSVP for these events will show up in the chat shortly. On to the show. So this is the Unplugged pre-party panel chat. Uh, so Unplugged is an Earth Hour based event that this year takes the shape of a dance party at your downtown central public library this Saturday night, starting at 7 p.m. and going till I believe it's 9.30. We'll check with Gerald as we get him here. Um, again, that's at your downtown public library featuring the, featuring the musical mastery of DJ Blackfoot. And we'll open up tonight's chat with Gerald Wheatley, one of the big brains behind the Arusha Center, Open Street Events, Calgary Dollars, Take Action Grants, and of course, the upcoming Unplugged event uh, this Saturday. Hey there, Gerald. Welcome to the show. Hey, Steve. It is going to be a party, actually. I spent yesterday afternoon um, with uh, Kevin Shostek from Protegeer, who's uh, an electronics engineer. He's built the sound systems that we've used on St. Patrick's Island for the last four years. And he is building an insane dance uh, sound system that we're going to be setting up in the library. Nice. Uh, DJ Blackfoot, I was on his show on Saturday. He's super excited putting a playlist together and he's an incredible mixer too. So it's music and a show uh, it will be all renewably powered this is one of the technical aspects of it um, to have a 4,000 watt system with subwoofers and everything that's run all on renewable power is quite a challenge and so each year Kevin is basically he just rips it all apart he said that was all horrible I got to build something totally new right right and then he stresses out for three months building the biggest thing that he can possibly imagine um, nice. so that's what he's doing in his shop the uh the crazy genius there working on his sound system so that's all coming together um it's that part of it the dance part of it is going to be great um because as people know in the atrium in the library there were the dj and the dance par party portion is right on the main stairs so if people know where the buffalo is and so the lights when they go off 8 30 to 9 30 um i'm really looking forward to that because we've got smoke and lasers and derby lights and a whole bunch of things that'll wow. kick in on the renewable power when uh when 8 30 rolls around for earth hour so uh, you know i just had to tell you that right away because that's like the exciting thing that's just been happening yeah yeah well i mean it, it what a cool place to have a party like that Absolutely. Absolutely. It's such a gorgeous building. Um, and it's such a, you know, it's on district energy there from the cogeneration site. Um, and so it's an environmental building. It's, it's the way we should be building uh, our yeah. structures into the future, right? Yeah, it's really an architectural marvel, like the year that that uh, library came into place, I think it won a whole bunch of awards, right? 
Mm -hmm. And yeah, uh, the description, it's a, a Fabergé egg of a building, you know, right? these beautiful little panels fitting together. Um, but um, okay, so that's what's happening right now. We're really excited. Um, we just got the mayor's address encouraging Calgarians to get involved in the event. Um, all the programming is confirmed. Um, the, the, what people can expect at this event, um, we are going to have eight different installations where people can be pedal powering a virtual reality high speed cycle track throughout downtown. So on a 12 foot projection that's powered by the people riding bikes, you'll have an experience of how beautiful our river walk pathways and the cycle track downtown are. Um, we have our pedal power tower which is like a midway game that the, if you want to get up to 300 watts you ring a bell at the top um, we've got a green power pitch where sponsored by ace uh, which is alberta cooperative energy um, where you we want people to be involved in buying their own renewable power and we want that to be alberta owned and so they're going to be sponsoring the green power pitch where people can throw balls win prizes win discounts on on signing up with ace we also have the Enlightenment Challenge head-to-head -head competition between incandescent lights and LED lights, um, button-making photo booth, um, hot chocolate from Good Earth that the Permaculture Guild is going to be putting soil and seeds in, and people can take it straight home and plant it in their yard and get their garden growing right cool. after the event. Well, that's going to be a, a heck of a night, and I don't uh, make it out to a lot of events these days, but I feel like that's uh, that's going to be a good, good one to hit up. Is it? Do people, do folks wear masks to this, or what's the? Well, that's actually significant too, because this is mm. the first group event that the public library has done for two years, and yeah. so we're going to have limited capacity there. I would suggest people get there right at seven. Um, so there's going to be limited capacity in the theater for the presentations as well as in the foyer areas where all the programming is going to be happening. Um, there, so there will be social distancing. Um, people are certainly welcome to wear masks. Um, that's not going to be a requirement. It's the focus is on the on the social distancing. Okay. And, yeah. and it's nice that that's a great big high ceiling, uh, you know, nice, um, incredibly well designed building for airflow and all that. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I, I'm not sure, um, I wanted to talk a little bit about the history. I know we, you know, with, with the history of Earth Hour, yeah. um, you know, there's, there's a lot of history there and actually a lot that's been changing over the last um, few years too. Sure. Um, so we can talk about that. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, if you want to, if you want to, that that doesn't hurt to just sort of introduce that, and then we can we can flow into a conversation with the panel if you felt like it. Yeah, sure, for sure. And all the panelists have been involved in this for as long as I have, I think. So uh, they can all chime in. But um, um, the, some of the unique aspects uh, of Earth Hour for us at the Arusha Center, um, we were connected through our Take Action grants um, to original Earth Hour events that the Eco Living um, Society had organized uh, when the event started back in 2007. Um, community association events, um, faith groups were organizing. Um, but then um, seven years ago, what really shifted was um, the opportunity that was seen there for corporate Calgary and for business and building managers. Um, if you are trying to build an office building that is the highest environmental standards around the world, Earth Hour is recognized, right? And so as a global campaign, there were offices um, in Europe that had buildings here or managed buildings here or companies that had, had offices in Europe or in, in Australia. And so the city council started noticing that these lead buildings, platinum lead buildings, were doing Earth Hour events as a way to educate thousands of, of Calgarians. Um, so our Open Streets events program got hired to set up our bike generators and do energy awareness in some of these lead buildings in Calgary. And so that really started, you know, it moved from World Wildlife Fund and, and community groups, faith groups into business and corporate and the, op and the scale 
scale became huge, right? So, you know, there was one year where we had each floor of one of the uh, Brookfield properties come down and pedal power as hard as they could, and they would audit their floor for energy consumption before and after, and whichever floor in a 25-story high-rise did the best for reducing their energy consumption, they won a bunch of prizes, right? Mm -hmm. So exposure to thousands of people was enough that city council said, this is something that we're willing to put our name behind. It was the first public facing climate change event may still be actually of um, like a public open event that's organized by the city of Calgary. And so that really kind of got the synergy. The point isn't really and never was really about measuring exactly 60 minutes of energy saving. The point is we're trying to unite the planet. Now we've had the pandemic and more than ever, we need to recognize that we're all people on one on one planet. Mm -hmm. And it just is a bookmark in the year where we can all come together, um, recognize our interdependence, recognize climate change is affecting us all. And what the reason we call it unplugged is because we wanted to add to that connecting to our community, maybe disconnecting from our devices and getting connected to the community. Um, so Good Earth does acoustic um, guitar and candlelight events in various cafes. Um, and I, I cracked up a couple of years ago, radio stations started doing broadcasting acoustic um sessions just acoustic guitar sessions for earth hour you know right. so it's an accessible way for lots of different people to get involved yeah i think uh you know it, it's it's something i i think it's 160 countries around the around the, the planet that are now uh uh, yeah, it's, it's over 170. And there's organizations like FIFA and Reuters. And, you know, I, I, I interact a lot with entities that have, you know, 4 million followers or 8 million followers, you know, but right. so anyway, so it's the exposure is huge. And the endorsements are, are huge there. So for Calgary, you know, it's just it's just a great opportunity to try and, and um, connect across different segments. Um, whether that's, you know, Good Earth providing the hot chocolate or cooperative energy um, or the public library and, and the city of Calgary. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, okay, so I think I'm going to going to uh, uh, introduce some of our fellow panelists who are also participating in this event tonight. Um, so maybe I'll just sort of go around the room and uh, and introduce uh, some folks that, that maybe some folks have uh, seen on this show before and others that maybe you haven't. Um, but maybe uh, I'll start with Aaron Bird. Maybe just tell us a little bit about what you're doing with uh, Circular Economy Club uh, Calgary these days. Sure. Thanks, Steve. Um, and yeah, a lot of you might recognize me from my role in Fairtrade Calgary, but I've gotten a little bit more involved in another club, another grassroots initiative called Circular Economy Club. And there are uh, grassroots chapters all over the world uh, that are circular economy clubs, but we've created one in Calgary. Uh, it's fairly new still like we've been in existence for about five years or so but um we're we're still you know trying to gather some momentum around it and uh it just seems like there's a, a lot of initiatives that are sort of coming together and uh, along the same veins as, you know, Climate Hub and thinking about climate change and climate action and what we can do to make our lives more sustainable, our world, world more sustainable. And the big initiative that we're trying to do right now in Circular Economy Club is understand a bit more of how we can make repair instead of throwing things into the landfill, making repair a more normal part of our life and building capacity for uh, repairing things either ourselves or in creating spaces for people to make their hobby into almost a side business and create uh, maybe a supplemental form of income for some folks. So, so that's something that uh, we'll be trying to highlight during Earth Hours. So please come and visit our booth. We have a survey out where we're trying to gather more information and understand what it would take to make a more sustainable repair exchange with the number of communities in Calgary. So yeah, that's I'll just I'll stop there and let you introduce some of the other folks on the call. I think that's a really, really cool idea. I love it. You know, I, something that dovetails with that a little bit is, uh, you know, one of those places where you can leave stuff that isn't necessarily junk 
uh, but you don't need any more. And, you know, while you're there, you see a lamp that you're like, I could use that lamp. And you just take the lamp. I don't know what they call that, but like, we need more of that, I feel like. And I feel like it's kind of related. You, does that make sense? Yeah, I think that there's an initiative actually in Edmonton where it's called like the zero waste store or some, okay, yeah. I can't remember the exact term of it. And I mean, you know, Alice Lamb, for those of you who know Alice, is trying to do something very similar with her good neighbor store. Like it's, you know, take what you need and uh, there's a, a scale on if, if you can't pay, just pay what you can, which mm. I think is such an awesome initiative. And it ties so nicely, like it, it, it's all intersecting quite nicely into all of these initiatives that we're doing. So, you know, the more that we can leverage what each other is doing and make this really a uh, a combined effort uh, and get people to change the way they live and live more uh, frugally and more consciously, like just conscientiously, I guess, is what yeah. I purposefully, um, yeah, struggling for the right word there, but all of those words kind of make sense to me. Yeah, well, you know, there's there's probably like three or four things that have been my in my apartment for like, I, I've become a minimalist and I'm always looking to try to like pare down and get rid of stuff. And it's just like, uh, who am I going to give this thing to? You know, I'd, I'd love to be able to drop off something that somebody could use, but uh, very, very cool stuff. You're always up to cool stuff. So, uh, so I'm glad that we get to get a chance to catch up like this. Katrina, I haven't actually got to meet you before from the Alberta Institute for Wildlife Conservation. Why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, what the, what the good folks at the AIWC are up to? Awesome. Thanks so much, Steve. And, and thank you for having me on this panel as well. Um, we've been involved with uh, with Earth Hour um, since before I joined the organization, which was six years ago. So we've definitely been uh, been on board for quite some time. And um, really, this is this dovetails so nicely with what we do at the Institute, because we're a wildlife hospital. So mm -hmm. we go out and we rescue injured and orphaned wild animals from really southern Alberta, but we do take animals from from other sections of the province as well. And uh, as we all know, I think, you know, animals have been uh, severely impacted by climate change in many different ways. And that's not just, you know, the, uh, the lovely flagship species that we're always thinking about when we think of, you know, the World Wildlife Foundation and everything like that. It's not just the pandas, it's everything. And a right. lot of those animals are, are close to home as well. So we're seeing impacts from climate change on our bird species here in Alberta, on our bats, um, on our trees, as even on our moose as well. Mm -hmm. So there's lots of uh, areas that, that we really see those impacts and what we want to do at our institute is make sure that everyone is aware about those and also what we can do about it. Yeah. Um, it's, it's very easy to get bogged down in the negative, especially when we're talking about how, how bad things are getting for some of our species. So we have a climate and creatures education program that uh, we actually talk about, you know, not just what the effects of climate change are on our species, but how we can help like locally and uh, and what we're doing here in Calgary on a larger scale as well to help those animals. So um, we're really happy to offer that to schools and uh, also different groups as well. So brownies or scouts or, or all of those uh, oh, yeah. areas too. So. You know, do you end up dealing with the Alberta Council for Environmental Education? Yeah, we, we work with them a lot. Absolutely. Oh, they're tough. I was going to, that, that's, I was going to make, okay, do I have to make a connection here? You're already on it. <laughs> we're that's in great. it. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, no, we, yeah, we they, chat with them a lot and uh, do a lot of the the conferences with them too. Um, and then my my main role is a community engagement coordinator. So I'm right, okay. the, the person who kind of does a lot of the education programs and then also has fun on social media answering some of those weird nice. and wacky wildlife questions. Right. Well, I you know very quickly I, I don't want to spend the spend the night talking about me, but here we go. Uh, so it was New Year's Eve. I, it was like minus 30 and I, around the corner from my place, I live close to the elbow. There's this little corner in the river and I just, you know, I go there in the summertime and, and hang out by that river and, and it was, it was freezing cold in the winter. I'm going for a walk and I just felt like, you know, I never, I've never even looked at this place in the winter. I'm going to come down and check it out. And that tur turns out that's where like a whole platoon of ducks hang out. Yeah. And so, and, and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm now all, all of a sudden, I'm just like, how do these things even live in minus 30? They're floating in the water. I'm bundled to the, 
And so anyways, I have, I, I'm now, it's more like that pack of duck has adopted me. It's part of my <laughs> routine now. And uh, so I'm a, I've become a, a birdie, I guess. Is it a birdie? You don't, you don't say a birdie. Birder. A bird watcher? Birder. Birder. Yeah. Okay. If you See, want to this, get really technical about it. Right. You know, birdie sounds, sounds odd. There's, there's no way, there's no way around it. Birder. <laughs> fair enough. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, that's some really cool work that, uh, that you're into now. And that means another connection that I can reach out to for, uh, for wildlife, uh, all, all things wildlife. Life. that's cool absolutely um and then next up is uh, our returning champion i'll call her mackenzie cummings because i've had her on my show i think more than just about anybody uh but that means i'm doing the right thing because we should all be giving our platform to calgary's youth leaders whenever we can and um i would i can tell you that uh well, i should say the name of the organization mackenzie's with is fridays for future calgary uh and i very recently took part in uh, their event on the Saturday morning in conjunction with 350.org's Day of Action for a Just Transition. Um, and uh, I think I might have put a link to the event because we did record it for Facebook Live. And what the uh, Fridays for Future youth had organized was they put up a mock press conference that they were that they were a government ministry opening up called the Ministry for a Just Transition. I mean, how cool is that? How smart is that? How important is that? That's what this group does. And that's Mackenzie's, I, I think, one of the one of the leaders of that group. And so Mackenzie, uh, welcome to the show once again. Thanks for coming on. Yes, hello. My family is being extremely loud. So oh, I hope you, you can got a hear party me. Going on. But <laughs> I don't know why they decided to take pink, bring out banjos right now. Right. Um, anyways, yes, I'm Mackenzie. I organize with Fresh Shift Calgary um, and Climate Strike Canada. Um, and yeah, last um, last Saturday, I guess, uh, March 12th, or it's been two Saturdays ago now, um, we held um, a press conference kind of imagining what could be announced um, with a just transition. Act and the creation of just uh, the ministry of, um, which happened to be in Prairie Winds Park parking lot. Um, and yeah, we had a speech kind of outlining lots of good benefits and kind of how it could be um, done. Obviously, we're not experts on a just transition, but we discussed general things um, like unionizing workers, um, ensuring their benefits for people, because obviously, as we face out fossil fuels, jobs will be lost. So we talked about job creation as well um, and how we can incorporate justice, particularly for Indigenous folks. Um, into that. Uh, there is video up on um, the Climate Hub's Facebook. Uh, we also have video, but we have been having technical issues because our camera cards were not uh, doing great. Uh, but eventually those will be um, released on our Instagram, our Facebook, our Twitter, etc. But well, yeah. Know, I'm going to, I'm going to, uh, I had thought that I put that link into the chat. I haven't already, but I'm going to work on that but in the meantime what uh what sorts of things do you think are coming down the pipe uh this year for fridays for future yeah well this friday uh is it's friday march 25th uh it's an international global day of action um organized by fridays for future international um so international climate strike movement um the theme this strike is people not profit maybe it's people over profit the prior prioritizing people instead of profit um but yeah, for us here in Calgary, um, along with lots of places across Canada, uh, we'll be holding an action outside our uh, RBC at Bankers Hall. Um, our RBC is a huge funder of fossil fuel projects. Um, mm -hmm. And in order to face it, put pressure on the fossil fuel industry, we'll need to make sure that they lose their social license to operate. Um, and this includes um, targeting those who finance them. You know, our, our world is driven uh, by where the money is. Um, so yeah, that is super exciting. It's technically not announced yet, so you guys are all the first to know. Uh, but that will be um, March 25th, noon at the RBC at Bankers Hall. Uh, not a huge protest or anything like that. We'll be dropping off a letter um, that's currently in the works with our group, um, essentially outlining what we would like um, from them on their April 7th AGM. Um, so yeah, that is very, very exciting to be announced soon, uh, tomorrow morning, I believe. Um, further along, March 25th, we'll be at, uh, or March 26th, we'll be at uh, the event of the Public Library. Um, generally, just a chat about what, what we're up to um, and some of our actions. So you will be able to find us there at a booth. Um, other than that, we have not <laughs> planned too far along the road. Um, we've had a lot going on as of recently, but we're hoping to keep the pressure up on RBC leading up to their AGM. Um, yeah. 
Yeah, you know, I, I RBC is so involved with um, with with pipeline funding. I keep wondering if they if they they must have a strong relationship with Russia. And so I keep feeling like, you know, there's a lot of organizations and companies that are pulling out of Russia due to the war. And uh, I haven't heard RBC say anything yet. So if, if you're listening to RBC, now's a good time to start doing stuff like that. In fact, maybe some time ago, but why not now? Um, yeah, okay. Well, fair enough. Um, so that's, uh, that's a, a bit of an idea about some of the things that are going on from some of the, the community uh, climate and, and, uh, and climate adjacent leaders here in Calgary. Um, so I guess, you know, when I think about, there's a, I have a couple of thoughts about um, events like Earth Hour and uh, just climate generally. And, and I actually had a really interesting chat. I think you were on that panel, Mackenzie, when um, uh, Celia from Sustainable Calgary was on. And, you know, she closed with something that really struck a chord with me. And I think it ties in exactly to what Unplugged is all about. Uh, and if I, if I had my producer with me, she'd play that clip, but instead you're just going to get me describing it. But uh, what Celia was, was saying is that, you know, this, this world, it just seems to be getting more and more serious. And, you know, like climate is such a serious topic. The, pr protecting the wildlife, it's such a serious topic. And at the same time, we have to find a way to, to have fun with each other. And we have to find a way to make it fun for, for, for us to do events where, it's, you know, we can't just doom and gloom our way through this. We, we've got to find a way to, to feel happy and, 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 and party a little bit. So um, the question that I have uh, for the, you know, I mean, I guess maybe I might even start with Gerald just because you, you seem pretty plugged into this vibe, you know, with, with that's what Unplugged really is. Like the first I ever heard of Earth Hour, I heard about from you years ago, and you were doing an event at, at uh, one park or another, and maybe there is acoustic guitars or whatever it is. And, you know, that's a compelling thing. That's a fun thing. And it's not just like doom and gloom. So, I mean, what, 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 what's the, is there a future for, for events where we find a way to make this fun and engaging with folks? Oh, absolutely. Um, that's, um, that's why I started a band, started playing music. Um, I, I had opportunities to talk to uh, musicians. Um, Pete Seeger has been a, an activist with, uh, before he passed away in the complimentary currency movement. Um, Billy Bragg, um, using entertainment and music as a as a motivator. Obviously, you know the Clash and Bruce Springsteen and the lots of lots of pop music, right? Is conscious yeah. music, Bob Marley, and and so um, having components. Um, Arusha produced um, four compilation albums called "Hold Your Ground" of Alberta musicians, country musicians, and punk rock musicians, and every everything in between um, on music of social relevance, uh, conscious music um that experience was actually it was after producing those four albums that i decided that i needed to start playing music myself because it is so in, it's been so inspiring to me mm. um and you know i um i called up core blonde got a number from somebody and he didn't want to do it he said he was already this is 10 years ago he was already kind of the activist hippie in his group of friends he said and so i can't do more i can't do more of the activist <laughs> stuff but then i told him ian tyson contributed a song i'd been given ian tyson's phone number at home and so i phoned him up and ian tyson just said yeah for sure i want to contribute some immediately and then holger peterson who owns his his record label groaned and and tried to prevent it from happening for a little while but when Corblun knew that Ian Tyson had contributed a song, that was he he agreed, and that's how they met, right? So activist conscious music it connected Ian Tyson and Corblund. It connects tons of people, right? It's the right. music that inspires us. So having a party, people like Salita work and the and the Mad Max rides and the bicycle yeah, yeah. culture, right? Having big parties, having fun, right? We um one of our our board members at Arusha years ago um, is a Filipino activist who had, uh, he had done his time uh, literally and figuratively in the Philippines. And uh, in one meeting, he said, you know, we should be less of the grim and determined and more of the fun, you know? So we have that yeah. saying at Arusha, a little less of the grim and determined um, and trying to make it fun so that people feel, you know, we're talking about really 
sensitive um, issues about the way we get to work and the way we get our kids to sports or whatever, right? So um, recognizing that, trying to trying to really make it fun, mm. is so is so critical. I think these groups actually are a great representation. I don't know what kind of magical curator you are that brought all these groups together because this is a great cross section. I think of what climate change is actually where we're at now is that climate change is is everything. Right. It's circular economy club. It's recognizing yeah. all that disposable stuff. Some of that can be prevented. Some needs to be prohibited. Right. Yeah. And fair trade, like the global economy we've with with ever evergreen and all these crazy global trade disruptions that we've had the wild species in the province. Um, the youth movements that have been happening on multiple levels of Black Lives Matter and Indigenous and murdered and missing Indigenous women, mm -hmm. you know, all of these actually come together under a, a, a vision that is an inspiring one, right, about equity and about sustainability for the planet. Um, so I think this kind of reflects part of this, of that party aspect, right, that we're, it's a social thing. There's lots of fun to be had along the way. Like that's one of the best parts out of my job is that we have take action grants. We've granted um, over 60 projects um, with half complimentary currency to keep money circulating, supporting local businesses and half cash from the Calgary Foundation. And um, we, we get to fund these wonderful projects, frontline projects or, or systems level projects. And um, that's the biggest change that I've seen. Um, we uh, suffered tons of, of, of ridicule around, um, around Earth Hour in the, in the early years where people just totally didn't, didn't get it, you know? Now it's pretty self-evident, I think. And all of these movements, people have been working on local food, people working on diversity issues, um, people working on economic equity issues, are now coming together in a, in a more coherent way than than I've certainly ever seen it before. Yeah, I, I think every you know climate has has you know I've been I've been paying attention to climate uh, really you know digging into it since two thousand and eight when I saw uh, Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth, and you know so I I was around for the period of time where you know climate was really just talked about by a bunch of people in a in a in an off room in a bar someplace and um you know a lot like few and far between the victories or the changes and now things are happening really really fast not as fast as we need it to be but as far as people's awareness and people understanding that it's a real thing. Like now you can't stand around and say it's, if, if you're saying it's, if, if you're going to play the denialist climate game right now, you're, you're, you're in the upside down world and everybody knows it. There's other ways that, that people slow things down and they, they there's games that, that we humans like to play, but that's changed a lot. And, and I think about in the last year, how many, or the last, since COVID, how many different times our borders have been a been a factor about uh, our food security, and so all now all of a sudden it's a lot easier for me to have the food security conversation with somebody than it was a year ago, two years ago. Things are changing. Well, it, well, really it was your it was at your um, climate conversation at HSCA where we had the friends of science there, and there was yeah, one yeah. guy in my group who is just made, wanted everybody to know that there's more CO2 in the pop that you might drink than there is in the atmosphere. So there couldn't be any problem with, with right. CO2 emissions. Like right. that's not that long ago, actually. And no, that's like not. nut bar crazy talk now. You know, we, so they were, what, what impressed me about that was, uh, you know, we had a full house at that, at that event. And Friends of Science, I, we figured out because we were able to identify, we think pretty much all of them. And they had, that night, they found a way to have, send seven or eight people to monitor at various times. And we figured out the man hours and it's like, well, you know, they obviously were doing something right if there's if we're if we're, you know, if they're coming to check us out and monitor us and put that kind of manpower in. just imagine they put it into something positive. That would be wonderful. Um, but uh, okay, how's so, you know, we're, we're sort of talking about this anyways, how are all of these changes impacting 
your organizations. You know, I, I, I think about, um, I op, my operating hypothesis is that we live in the climate era and every story is a climate story, which means I can, I can go from Omicron and I can talk, I can, I can tell you what, a, what the climate angle is on that. I can tell, I can look at the freedom convoy and I can tell you how that fits into disinformation around climate. I look at, I mean, there's, there's tons of climate stories uh, around Ukraine and Russia. And, you know, I feel like we went from freedom convoy to Ukraine, Russia, and, and, and we didn't, we didn't get to blink an eye. It happened so fast, but what are some of the teachable moments that, that, you folks are able to pull out from what's going on around the world and saying, Hey, listen, I care about this. And you're all talking about this. This is how that relates to this. Does anybody want to try to tackle that? Yeah, I would say like more so than every story is a climate story is the factors that have left us with climate change. Yeah. If you will, are those that have left us with global conflict um, and a whole lot of other injustices. And I don't want to be the person going around and screaming capitalism, colonialism, but there is certainly like values and ideologies that have obviously come to North America and such of green extraction um, that have caused many issues, climate included. Like, I feel like it's only one very small piece of the fabric, but if one part of the fabric is there, the whole fabric is there, is kind of how I see it. Mm -hmm. um, but yes, I definitely do agree that um, especially when we discuss Ukraine um, and just the fact uh, that so many other wars um, over natural resources that, yeah, there's a factor of cl what climate justice would be in allowing that we wouldn't have to have these wars. Um, I mean, we should never have to have them, but uh, they right. wouldn't they wouldn't have happened um, had we better organized our system um, mm -hmm. to serve everyone. Well, you know, the, the interesting thing, Mackenzie, is I, I was able to interview Michael E. Mann, um, world-famous climate scientist, and the, the main target of, of climate disinformation before, before disinformation was cool, you'd almost say. Um, and he, you know, reading his recent book, he'd, he'd be the first to tell you that, you know, Russian source disinformation was a big, played a big role in climate gate and a lot of the, the early climate denialism came from, you know, Russia is a petrostate and climate is a threat to petrostates. And, uh, you know, so that's, that's something that, and we're, and we're seeing that disinformation splay out across all sorts of different topics in all sorts of different countries. And uh, yeah, what about, what about you, Mackenzie, when, when you're, or not Mackenzie, sorry, Katrina, when you're, uh, when you catch something on the news, do you feel like, oh, you know, are people making the connection to wildlife on this yet? Oh, man, sometimes it's, uh, it's hard to just, you know, <laughs> not go crazy, honestly, and then yeah. not like pull out your own hair uh, all the time. Um, I've got some family members who definitely uh, fall into a little bit of the, uh, the disinformation world. And right. Uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's, it's frustrating to try and have those conversations. I think it's, it's still important because I, I want to know where they're coming from and, and what the, the thought process is behind this. But you know, they, they start talking about these things as if they don't affect us in Alberta. And right. that's, we're not immune. Like we're, we're everything around us is, is showing impacts of this, whether we've noticed it or not. Um, but certainly the animals have, have started showing signs of that, you know, um, with your ducks, Steve, uh, ducks. Mm. Yeah. That's not like, they're not normally here for the winter. Historically they haven't been. Um, but yeah, because of different changes in our climate and, and different weather patterns that we're now seeing more and more frequently, we are seeing ducks and geese, uh, coming over and what people don't right realize about that is that you know if we get a, a more typical winter um like when we had that three weeks of minus 35 here uh, yeah. that causes real issues for animals that are not right. adapted to that situation so we take in a bunch of ducks every year with frostbite on their feet right, real sure, serious sure. frostbite injuries and uh, and yeah there's a lot of people who just feel like oh well it got cold that one time so that's not we don't have climate change and it's like right. that is that is actually a part of climate change it's it's not just the temperature rising it's also you know the changing weather patterns having those polar vortexes come down and pull air from the arctic yeah well you know, you know? this year you think about it it was like it was it was almost like fall weather and then 
boom, minus 30. And, and, you know, if you're, if you're a duck trying to plan your holiday, it's, it's, it's hell on hell on wheels. Yeah, absolutely. Or bats trying to get into hibernation. We had to overwinter a few this year because they, they didn't quite make it before the temperatures right. really plummeted. Um, huh. Yeah, even um, with the, the really warm spring we're having has me a little bit nervous because, you know, some of our, our moose actually are getting what's called ghost moose syndrome. Um, don't know if you've heard of this before, but it's like Never when the moose go, go white. Yes. Yeah, um, there's a lot. There's a couple of moose in Tuscany. I, we got a lot of calls about last year and uh, and they're getting basically attacked by ticks. And normally okay. in like a colder winter, when we have that extended winter time period, the ticks would die. Um, but because we're having warmer periods, a lot of the ticks are surviving. The, they're essentially stressing the moose so much that their fur turns white huh. and creates a lot of health issues besides that, of course. So, you know, everything's connected and everything can, in a lot of ways, be linked back to climate and what's going on with that. Yeah. I, I, as I say, we live in the climate era. So, you know, eventually that's the, that's, that's the filter that, uh, that operates for me and it helps me see what's going on around me. What about you, Aaron? Any of the, the big news stories of the day that, that, uh, that you feel like I hope people are making this connection or the, the, the teachable lesson that you're hoping people pick up? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's funny because uh, it's almost good that the pandemic lasted for this long because I think people started to have those aha moments about, oh, supply chain, this is yeah. starting to affect me. I can't get everything that I used to be able to get at the grocery store. I can't get things that are imported from this place anymore. <laughs> like it, it was an aha moment, but then uh, in the same breath, I worry because I, say, I saw a lot of people say, well, I can get this on Amazon or I can get this, you know, through another means. So right. I don't have to sacrifice my convenience. I can still get what I need. And maybe there are limited choices, but they're still not limiting my style of life to change significantly. So, you know, there is good news. And then there is just... Um, I guess, worry that people will, you know, go back to normal and go back to being oblivious and not really care as much, um, you know, at least COVID brought some awareness. And I'm hoping that people, it will stick with people that, hey, you know what, uh, you don't always get the luxury of being able to get an avocado or a banana from another country. And, and do you make, do you actually think about the math of where, what things cost and the, the, carbon footprint it has on the environment like I don't yeah. think to this day I don't think people realize that when you go to the store right now the blueberries are from Argentina right They're not from BC <laughs> like right. we don't grow blueberries in winter in Canada <laughs> and and so it, it's still like I, I, I still see that we have more progress to make and and with circular economy again like it, it just is so easy for people to say oh I'm just going to take that to the dump instead of well maybe I could fix this or maybe somebody else could use it or maybe I could refurbish this or and I mean yeah. the, the good news is that yeah there's been a lot more thought about you know there's a maker market out there there's people that are being inventive there's and when you mentioned Star Wars I was thinking to myself when watching the Star Wars films everybody in Star Wars is a mechanic they yeah. all know how to fix a starship. They just right. all seem to have those skills. Yeah. Is that going to be us in the future? I really hope so. That would be super exciting because that means that we're all going to be fixers in the future. So, you know, there's there's things to look forward to. There's opportunities to grab onto. And, and sure as heck, I want to make f something fun out of this too. And that's where, you know, at Earth Hour, there's going to be a banana suit out there that's going to be dancing to the music and making it fun and making it people. If that's what sticks in your mind and makes you think of fair trade, great. Uh, you know, if I can put a fun element to a serious topic that is going to help change our system, then that's what I want to do to, to help make it happen. So, so yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of my takeaway. And you've, you've done a great job with that, with fair trade and circular economy, the, the connections between those, those two things are so close and uh, synergistic. Um, and you and I have talked about the repair cafe at Hillhurst Sunnyside, right? That um, the potential, there's there are these issues um, like the lithium batteries that we all have in our wireless uh, earphones and all these devices that are 
largely not recyclable. A lot of the AirPod, like AirPods, they're glued straight in, right? So yeah. you, it's it's a new level of disposability when you buy something that's worth two or three hundred bucks, and then after those charges, you have to throw it out. You can't even replace. Speaking of Kevin Shostek, the electrical en- engineer that's building the PA for Saturday, he doesn't want anything to do with lithium batteries because lead acid batteries are so recyclable and um, they're very heavy, but they're far more environmental right now because of the limited ability So to, to recycle those. So your work, Aaron, with um, Circular Economy and what Hillhurst Sunnyside has done with the Repair Cafe um, all fits into that new definitions of what's fair trade, right? Are we sending our garbage elsewhere or are we sending it into um, the oceans and, and the air, you know? Um, that's actually a piece um, for Saturday. One of the other things that we'll um, be adding in the into the programming is the uh, public launch of the Hillhurst Sunnyside Climate Action Toolkit. Um, so my coworker Jared has worked for the last year with the staff of HSCA to assess all of their programs from childcare to seniors food programs to their planning committee and say, what? let's look at this from a climate lens. You know, if we're advocating for more density in housing, what's the benefit of that? If we put child Childcare in our neighborhood so people don't have to drive so far. What's the benefit of that? If we bring in fresh roots and we're providing food locally so people don't drive or we're um, lo- providing local f- food through YYC growers, right? So their food miles are lower. All of those things kind of analyzed so that we can say these are the priorities for Hillhurst Sunnyside based on their programs that are already there. And what could they be emphasizing for the climate benefits as well? So we're, that'll be something that's on the program. There'll be staff from HSCA that'll be there. They'll go kind of over their own climate action toolkit. Um, and we're providing grants. Anybody on this call can look at arusha.org. Um, you can apply for a take action grant on the 15th of each month. Um, and we're going to be providing climate oriented grants for Calgarians to take on projects. Um, so hopefully they see initiatives like where, you know, this panel has been working on, get excited and put in an application and um, take action on that. I, I should mention that uh, I, uh, the Calgary Climate Hub, applied for a take action grant and we got that and that helped build uh, some of the show that you see before you right now and uh, should also mention that uh, when the when called upon from Calgary Fairtrade to don the banana suit I uh, did indeed don the <laughs> banana suit downtown downtown Calgary baby no fear <laughs> <laughs> well, and coming back to what Mackenzie had said, um, to double down on that, um, you know, we have a global economy that is uh, artistically designed to consolidate wealth with those that have wealth and to yeah. prevent those that don't have wealth from getting wealth. So it's it's a powerful system. It's provided a huge amount of benefit for a huge number of people. But if we don't think the wealth gap is growing, we are delusional. Um, Jason Kenney's asked what it was asked, what is his specific ambition? And he said to prevent collectivism. So his goal is to privatize, right? That's his modus operandi as a politician. He hasn't had any other jobs. So that's his only calling in life is to fight collectivism. So I agree with you, Mackenzie, that we have big problems and the global problems of climate change are parallel with economic problems of equity. Um, There's no sign that that equity is going to become more uh, or the the, um, distribution of wealth is going to become more equitable in the future. Uh, We're on a runaway train in the wrong direction there. And so that is something that's um, primary to those of us that started Calgary Dollars to talk about different monetary systems. It was primary to us to start take action grants to get more people feeling empowered to be able to to do things in Calgary. Um, so I totally agree with you, uh, Mackenzie, this, um, we got to look at it systems level. I think, you know, it's, it's almost like I, one of the things that I, I think I see happening, which I think is, is important is we're increasingly, we're just seeing that climate and, and justice issues are inextricable. You can't, 
they're 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 just so interrelated that you can't really pull pull them out and and you know that's why you're seeing a lot more focus on just transition these days and and i think that's the right move um but uh yeah no i i, I think you're right we um, we have a lot of work to define that um yeah. a lot of you know a lot of us saw were shocked when dave Broncagne ran under a sustainability making calgary sustainable when I saw that word on billboards, that was the first time I'd seen it in a large format. It turns out he meant financially sustainable, right? right. So it wasn't like what I thought he was talking about. Um, right. We are we are definitely in jeopardy of losing the definition of just transition. We have to give it the teeth. Um, we need community ownership. We need non-corporatization. Uh, we need local ownership. Um, I, I say that because Arusha works, um, we struggle with those same things where we aspire to be non hierarchical, we all get the same salary, we make decisions by consensus, we need to amplify the businesses like Allium and other worker co ops, you know, yeah. Corcoran's working on and Seth Leon, we need people that are rethinking the systems of our economy, um, we need entrepreneurism. And we don't need uh, people to say, if you're critical of the system, you're anti-entrepreneurial. Um, the people that I meet in community work are the most entrepreneurial, the most creative people, but we need to be consensual and non-hierarchical as well. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Um, okay, so my final question here, uh, I, I, I was thinking about Earth Hour a lot coming into this show. And, uh, you know, I think that... I think Earth Hour has done a really good job on putting climate uh, in front of people and and across the world and and um, you know the one the one or the, or the criticism I think that that comes up is that um, you know there's there's a there's more of a focus on individual actions and in the last few years we've really started to figure out that you know the big piece of this is systemic and and how do we switch that you know if there's if there's 87 or, or 100 company companies are responsible for 87 percent of climate change or whatever that stat is um you know so i think about how can earth hour you know shift I, I think we we have to have the personal responsibility part we it, it this whole thing requires our leadership to do things like not throwing things out in the garbage and getting repairing it and, and, and bring it to you know all of this stuff takes leadership from folks like us um but when when it comes to you know the big win on climate we have to address systemic uh and then the other thing i was thinking about is just that earth hour is once a year it's 2022 what if earth hour was once a month what might that look like i was thinking about what if earth hour was once a week there's 160 hours in a week what if what if there's a commitment to spend one at one of those 100 now you spend a lot of time sleeping and eating and doing all that stuff but you know like this this week for earth hour i did this this week for earth hour i did that maybe this is what we're doing for earth hour this week kind of thing anyways i just wanted to sort of open up the idea that you know, can Earth Hour does 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 it need an upgrade? Does it need a renovation, or could it? Or is there more we can do with it? I certainly, I feel like we need more Earth Hours. You know, so uh, well, I can. I mean, I can start. I'm probably the one uh, most uh, at task on that one. Um, so. Um, we had been going, we been, Open Streets had been going to festivals across the province for five years. Yeah. Um, we would do 40 or um, up to 46 events a year. We'd get about 10,000 people on our bikes for in various yeah. years. Um, after years of doing that, we just felt, you know, people are open to this. Like yeah. there, I expected to get Rotten Tomatoes or something at some of these events. You know, you go do, we were in the Stampede Parade a couple of times. We are in, you know, large scale Canada Day events and things. Um, and everybody's ready for that. They've been ready for it for years, right? So yeah. our, our transition in, in trying to support um, Hillhurst Sunnyside is really to take it up a, a notch with work with community associations. There's a great network called Green Leagues of Community Leagues in Edmonton. Yeah. 
yeah. and put the pressure from the bottom up. That's what we've seen in, in the U.S. and other places. Um, the institutions that, you know, the dinosaur institutions and companies are the last to change. They need pressure from below. Um, so that's part of our strategy. That's part of our strategy of increasing the amount of grants that we have available for climate change work. Um, so it's definitely trying to amp amp that up and yeah. we're building on that momentum of earth hour but really uh, so you know we work um with about four thousand kids that come through with the mayor's environment Ex expo um this year we'll be doing programming for energy efficiency day which the city council just endorsed here in calgary um in 2019 never did anything on it yet we will be doing work on that this year again that's a national campaign so those are examples of trying to you know kind of up up the ante um and i think a lot of us um you know we make decisions um constantly around the environmental impacts of what we're doing and so it's it is um Earth, that's one of the challenges with Earth Hour, you know, um, and why I like making it as much a party as it is a networking event is to keep keep people motivated and, you know, um, there's there's events like um, plastic free YYC and there's permaculture cabin fever and there's just a wonderful selection of different events happening throughout the year that I would hope would would fit with with Earth Hour in in the in a general sense you know. I should mention also that uh, for our community climate conversations uh, that we went all over the city engaging neighborhoods with, we had that ele the uh, bicycle powered sound system from open street events and uh, so it, it was a, it was very uh, valuable for folks to see other ways of, of, of powering things and, and uh, so that's that's it's always been a, a great little uh, little thing for our for our yeah, events thanks for there. doing that. Oh no! Well, thank, thanks for giving us a, something something special that we're able to do like that. Um, what? Well, I'll go around the the room there. Are, are there? I mean, things that things that things that Earth Hour maybe could do more of, or that we could do more of Earth Hour. You know, whether whether it's more frequently or whether it's adjusting the systemic. Any any ideas from the the rest of the panel on that? Even if it's something that that you know if 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 humans were to spend one hour per year on just your cause, what might that be? Uh, it's it's wide open here. I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll go, oh, ahead. go ahead. You go Sorry, ahead, Aaron. Katrina. No, no, you go no ahead. after you. <laughs> I love it. I love it when they're fighting to talk. That's wonderful. Uh, yes, <laughs> please. No, you after you. No, it's a Canadian standoff, right? That's it. Oh dear. No, I think uh, your your idea of doing Earth Hour more often is is really great because it is such a recognizable. Um, I, would, I hesitate to say brand, but mm -hmm. you know, it, it's one of those events that everybody has some base awareness of and what that kind of earth hour looks like could vary depending on the month or could vary on depending on the week um if we were going to do you know a, a wildlife only themed earth hour or something like that i mean there's so many different ways for people to get involved just with with that specific field um doing helping with a bird count once a week. I mean, if people are interested in doing that, there's a lot of different bird counts out there. Um, I know the Weasel Head um, organization does a lot of bio blitzes is what they call them, where they okay. take volunteers and they have them actually help out with surveying some of the, the amazing Weasel Head Park here in Calgary. So that's certainly something to look into um, doing the Christmas bird count anywhere in your community. That's a worldwide event. I mean, this would be so fantastic just to get people to really recognize what's in your own backyard because it's you know one step from recognizing the next step is actually helping and wanting to keep those those animals in your backyards can i admit my ignorance here and tell you i don't know exactly what a bird count is i mean i can <gasps> guess but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah no a bird count is is honestly exactly what it sounds like you, yeah. you go out to a specific area and you count the birds so you count the number of you know magpies that you see uh you count the number of wax wings that you see this time of year and that data even though it doesn't sound like tremendously woo um it's really really important because bird populations are one of the main indicators if something's happened in the environment 
Um, if you remember or remember hearing about DDT back in the 60s, right. um, that was only noticed when bird populations massively crashed. Huh. So by keeping track of these things year over year, we can hopefully prevent massive crashes of future uh, situations happening. So, so I have been already amateur bird counting. Uh, it's inevitable because <laughs> once you get into the ducks, you get into the Canada geese. Slippery slope, man. And then, oh, it's a slippery slope, <laughs> you know, and I'm, I'm watching where they're flying. I'm like, okay, so he's following the river. Oh, okay yeah of course they're following the river they're animals all animals do that and anyways yeah no i'm uh i'm right there so i'm looking into this now you might you might uh you might have to draft me in there coach <laughs> hey <laughs> you have my, you have my contact details steve get in touch we take right, volunteers right. if you want to pick up skunk poo i got a job for you <laughs> yeah that's a tough sell tough sell you had me and then you lost me just like that <laughs> skunk poo sounds like the worst thing i've ever heard of <laughs> you know, it makes diaper poo look a lot better. I will tell you All that. Right. Fair <laughs> enough. Fair enough. Um, Mackenzie, what were we even talking about? Oh yeah. Um, Earth Hour, uh, your, your, your final take. Yeah. Um, I'm a big fan of events like Earth Hour. Um, I am less a fan of putting the idea of fighting climate on individuals. Um, obviously yeah. this is not an attack at anyone doing individual events or anything like this, but just as a general, I do think, um, and I've been in some sorts of organizations where it's very much, if you're not recycling, you're not doing anything for the environment where it's very much, um, well, it's the recycling systems. Um, but also just the fact that not everyone can do everything, um, individually. Mm -hmm. So instead we should make a place where individual action is a lot more, um, I don't know, a lot more accessible, I guess is the right word for it, but also one where it's not just reliant on individual action. And as much as I like to say this, we need a just transition. <laughs> um, yeah. But yes, obviously not a dig at anyone doing individual action. I think it's extremely important. If you have the time, the money um, and everything like that, please do. <laughs> mm -hmm. But yeah. All right. How about you, Aaron? Yeah, I guess along the same lines, a little bit of what Mackenzie is doing is it can sometimes feel like if you're just doing stuff in your own household, it's it's very lonely and very daunting. And not everybody wants to go to their supermarket and say, I want you to carry fair trade bananas um, or, you know, be a voice for change and feel like you have to be holier than thou and perfect in everything that you do in your life. I think there's a quote that Plastic Free YYC uses a lot is, not everybody has to do zero waste perfectly, but, but you have to have many people doing it imperfectly and just understand that you can always improve and there's always somebody doing it better than you and always somebody doing it a little bit worse than you or you know, not necessarily comparing that way, but just knowing there's always more that you could be doing. And, um, and I'm always a, a big fan of trying to find fun ways to positively reinforce those who are doing uh, good stuff and doing uh, out of the box stuff and uh, call out to Lori and Gary who have done good mobs where you go to a store and you tell them, hey, I really love that you are offering this because it's sustainable or it's fair trade or it's uh, zero waste, you know, and having a whole bunch of your friends go or now that we have social media, we can even just post photos of going to certain stores virtually and saying, hey, I love that your store is doing this, please do more of it, and yeah. put a bit of peer pressure that way. I feel like systems change can happen uh, through that as well. And it requires many voices to make that change happen. You know, it's so interesting, you know, you, you think about how social network can be manipulated and the disinformation and all that. But the flip side is that, you know, if, if enough of us like something and care about it, then we, we, we talk about it on the social networks. And sometimes these big organizations have to respond to that. And uh, I, I see it all the time. And, and you know, so it is a very interesting, it's a double-edged sword, but uh, we get to hold that sword uh, sometimes too. Gerald, why don't you, why don't you close us out here? Um, yeah, and just to say, uh, it, it, the event on Saturday at the library is a free event. It's open to everybody at seven o'clock. Um, one of the aspects that's great is it's right downtown. So you can check out this beautiful building, um, but then there's also places right around there and um, Music Mile, a uh, number of the microbreweries do Earth Hour events where they have a sale. So you can come to our event and then you can go to one of the microbreweries or you can go um, down to the Eddy and watch some live music. Um, you can see the Saddle Dome turn off its the ring um, for Earth Hour. You can see the Calgary Tower turn off its uh, light for Earth 
Earth Hour. Um, if you can't attend the event, um, TEDx, YYC, um, Deborah and John are working with the techs at the library and they're going to be um, webcasting the event, both the presentations in the theater as well as it, the nuttiness in the foyer that'll be happening. Um, so you can check out TEDx, YYC and thanks, thanks to them for, for doing that live broadcast. Um, and one of the exciting things um, for me is that Chris Sung, who's a filmmaker uh, who's well known for Elder in the Making and some very inspired uh, documentary films, um, will be there shooting some footage for a documentary he's making on activism in Calgary over the last 50 years. Um, this year is actually the Arusha Center's 50th anniversary. Um, and so we're working with Chris to make a documentary to kind of to plot how so many things, including climate change, have changed over the last 50 years. Um, so Chris will be there doing some, um, some shooting and talking to people as well. So whether you can come to the event whether you can do something in your own home, maybe you live in the Beltline and you do, you just want to you know look at the Saddle Dome turn off and the Calgary Tower turn off. You can participate in lots of different ways. Well, I I think that's a great idea there, and I'm looking forward to uh, next Saturday night. Uh, thank you, Gerald from Arusha and Open Streets and all uh, Calgary Dollars and and the Take Action Grant. Did I get them all? Thanks, Steve. Yeah. All right. Yeah. I think you got them. Open streets. You got that. Yeah. yeah, yeah you got yeah. it. See, Thanks. You, know, you got, you wear a lot of hats and I nailed all the hats just now. I <laughs> pat myself in the back. Uh, Aaron Bird, Calgary Fair Trade and the Circular Economy Club of Calgary. Uh, thank you very much. Katrina Turrell, Tur I think it is. Um, Alberta Institute for Wildlife Conservation. First timer on the show. Glad to have you on here. And of course, uh, Mackenzie coming from the mighty Fridays for Future Calgary Youth Climate Action Superstars. Um, thanks so much, everybody, for coming on, and, and thanks for being on the same journey as me. Uh, uh, you know, trying to trying to trying to win this thing uh, for for the future. Um, you know, it's, it's important work that uh, that you all do. So uh, I'll just remind uh, everybody that uh, we do have another climate of change coming up on Wednesday, March thirtieth where we interview, uh, where we talk about the National Climate League and measuring what matters. Uh, and then, of course, the other event on your radar, April 6th at 7 p.m., the Edmonton Calgary Mayor's Summit on Climate Challenge or Climate Change with Mayor Amarjeet Sohi and Mayor Jyoti Gondek. Um, that will be, again, April 6th, and I think we've got the RSVPs in there. Um, that's all for now. Let's uh, We'll keep up the good work, and we'll see you Saturday night at uh, the Central Public Library for a little partying. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Thanks, Thanks Regina, so much, Steve. Aaron, Mackenzie. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Bye.